Hey everybody, today we're debating creation versus evolution and we're starting right now. Hey everybody, stoked to have you here. It's, oh, it feels like ages. I have been uh, really busy with research stuff and I was at a conference last week. Whew. It's been crazy, but I am honestly ecstatic to be here. It's uh, always a blast. And uh, this is going to be a lot of fun tonight. It's going to be short and sweet. Uh, we basically have uh, our debaters here for a limited amount of time, so I am not going to waste any time. I'm going to fly through our house cleaning stuff first. Want to mention, if you haven't heard, very excited. This week, just several days away, Friday, April 12th, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will have Dr. Robert M. Price on to debate the Christian apologist Jonathan Sheffield on whether or not a historical intellectual case can be made for the Christian faith. So, you don't want to miss that. It's going to be a blast. And, jumping right into it, both of our speakers have their links in the description. So, totally want to check, uh, want to encourage you guys to check out their links. So that way, even if you don't agree with them, even if you're like, oh my gosh, that's standing for truth, he just drives me nuts. Well, <laughs> yeah, he might grow on you. You never know. Uh, and Joseph is also one of my favorite people to have on. He's always been a good sport, and uh, both of these guys have. And so with that, their links are in the description. Hope you check them out. And we are going to have a kind of formal and kind of informal format for tonight. So I can just read that really quick. Eight minute openings, five minute rebuttals, and then 30 minutes of open discussion, followed by three minute to roughly three to five minute closings, and then Q&A for as long as we have the debaters. So the Q&A is probably gonna be short, to be honest. So if you want, if you have questions, just fire them into that live chat, and then I will try to fish them out and put them uh, into that list that we will read. and. If you make it a little bit easier on me, if you start it with at modern day debate and then, hey, this is my question for Joseph or standing for truth, you know, question, blah, 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 blah. And uh, almost forgot super chats. If you have a super chat, uh, that also allows you to make a comment for one of the debaters to respond to during the Q&A. And so it doesn't have to be a question in that case. And all super chats automatically go to the very top of the list throughout the debate or during the Q&A. So, with that, I am starting the timer. <sighs> Thanks so much for being here, everybody. This is going to be a blast. And usually we have a standing for truth, uh, taking the affirmative. Today it's creation versus evolution, so it's not uh, quite a yes-no type thing. It's just kind of defending their own position. But given that standing for truth, you're kind of used to going first. Uh, is that okay with you? Fine with me, James. Whatever works for you, brother. You got it. All right. Well, thanks for your patience, everybody. I have got the clock started, and I will click start on your first word. You got my um, screen shared uh, there, brother? I do. I have the screen share. Sweet. Just one second. Get this out of the way. Okay, well, let's get this party started. Uh, James, thanks for setting up this debate. And Joseph, thanks for uh, thanks for participating, man. We got creation versus evolution. News flash, good to you, evolution is pure imagination. SpongeBob, imagination, university. Plenty of applications have been received for SpongeBob University after my last debate here. But since I am standing for truth, it is of utmost importance that I stand up for what is the truth and expose all the lies. And you, my friends, have been lied to. There never was a singing warthog and meerkat. There, you've, you've been lied to. There's never been a singing lion, hog, and meerkat in a movie called Lion King. It's time to put away the Disney movies and start acting like a big boy. I know Hakuna Matata is a catchy song, but it's just not true. You've been lied to, and I'm here to help. The Tooth Fairy, once again, guys, you've been lied to. Money doesn't grow on trees, and it certainly doesn't magically appear under your pillow after you lose a tooth. I know this is going to be a shocker, everybody, but it's been your mama this whole time. It's time to grow up. You're a big boy now, and fish to fisherman evolution, it's pure imagination, as you know. I'll let you figure this one out for yourself, guys. 
what if I put a cape on? No, wearing a red Speedo does not give you the ability to fly, guys. Graduation day at SpongeBob University. Evolutionists are proud of their imaginations, like Aaron Ra here. Give them a round of applause, guys. Biblical creation, on the other hand, the model that I'm going to present, that's not about imagination. Other proud graduates of SpongeBob University, obviously, besides R and Ra, please refer to these men for the wild imaginative stories any SpongeBob University student could hope for. And also, congratulations to the non sequitur show. They have graduated officially from SpongeBob University, especially after the trickery they pulled last week on their channel, setting me up with R and Ra without actually confirming anything. That would be like me tonight after this debate, setting up a hangout titled Standing for Truth versus R and Ra. But he doesn't show up. I'm just going to claim victory. Guys, let's get into the biblical based model. And look to my last debate if you want a more thorough tour of SpongeBob University. The evolutionists, they'll look to similarity, but that's part of our model, homology. Let's look at sedans that are made and manufactured in not only Asia, also North America and Europe. They all share a common set of features. Even though there is a vast geological, geographical separation from the manufacturing locations of Honda, Chevrolet, and Mercedes, they all have four wheels doors on the side, windshields in the front, brake lights in the back, and a wide variety of other shared characteristics. Is this reason for similarity due to common ancestry? We know the reason for this similarity is because these cars were designed for similar functions. Absolute proof for biblical creation. Empirical evidence suggests that everything, including all life, is subject to entropic decay. This is exactly what we would expect and predict given a literal interpretation of Genesis. The evidence of entropic decay strongly indicates three very important things. The fall, as recorded in Genesis, is 100% real. Creation in the fall had to be quite recent, and prior to this genetic degeneration, Adam and Eve would have zero mutations. The absolute reality of genetic entropy, genomic degradation, means that goo to you evolution is going the wrong way. Things are degrading. Things are not being taken forward. We observe devolution and not evolution. I think this quote from the new book, Darwin Devolves by Michael Behe, is perfectly suitable to what I am saying here in regards to the biblical model. Darwinian evolution proceeds mainly by damaging or breaking genes, which counterintuitively sometimes helps survival. We'd expect this given the biblical based model. In other words, the mechanism is powerfully devolutionary, Michael Behe says. It promotes the rapid loss of genetic information. Laboratory experiments, field research, and theoretical studies all forcefully indicate that as a result, random mutation and natural selection make evolution self limiting. Darwin's mechanism works chiefly by squandering genetic information for short term gain. We are accumulating low impact deleterious mutations since the fall, consistent with biblical creation, inconsistent with goo to you evolution. It's a double whammy. Now, genetics confirms biblical creation. How much more time do I have there, James? You have three minutes and 10 seconds. Thanks, brother. Modern genetics has discovered Adam and Eve, Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel, and it's written in the human genome. The Bible makes predictions. Looking at the Adam and Eve story and the biblical base model, we can make numerous predictions. If we only started with two people, all the people today should have a low genetic diversity. But if we started with a million strong, you're going to have a lot of genes floating around a population of a million strong. But if you only started with two people, that really restricts the diversity today. Over deep time, any large population will accumulate enormous numbers of mutations, resulting in enormous amounts of genetic diversity. This is a serious problem for evolutionary theory because it is now clear that mankind has very limited genetic variation. While the observed low genetic diversity is a massive problem from the evolutionary perspective, this is most certainly expected and predicted from the biblical perspective. From the biblical model, we all come from just two people. This obviously means that limited diversity is easy to explain, and the Bible predicted this. If the Bible is correct and Adam really is our ancestor, there should only be one male ancestor of humanity. The small number of mutations that separate modern men from the sequence of Y chromosome Adam indicates that this man lived in the relatively recent past. Based upon the actual observed mutation rate for the human Y chromosome, studies show that Y chromosome Adam lived just thousands of years ago.
These findings are strong evidence supporting the literal Adam and Eve. There are many more predictions, the mitochondrial DNA, for example, in the three major haplogroups. Also, look at Noah's flood. This story tells us that all people should be closely related. It tells us there should only be a few mitochondrial DNA lines as Shem, Ham, and Japheth's wives. And only one Y chromosome, since only Noah, his three sons, would have inherited his Y chromosome. And we should have significant evidence of rapid population growth. It turns out that this, too, is exactly what we find in modern genetics. This doesn't all have to be true. Now... The Tower of Babel account, also perfectly consistent with a biblical base model. How much time there, James? You got one minute exactly. Perfect, perfect. So we have found a single dispersal of all people in the relatively recent past, traveling in small people groups into uninhabited territory through the Middle East. They call it the out of Africa story, but these are all biblical based predictions. Everything we see empirically demonstrates biblical based creation we can look to the created heterozygosity hypothesis to explain all the life we see if god created adam and eve and the created kinds with pre-existing functional dna differences we can make predictions we can make predictions on mutation rates and junk dna and these are things that um, joseph and i can get into in the discussion period so um james i'm happy with my presentation here and i can end my time thanks brother you bet. Thank you very much. Standing for truth. So we will now jump over to the dialogue box. And Joseph, on your first word, I will start the clock. And thanks again for being here. I'm not going to be too long. Um, I would just like to open up by stating that evolution would not, by design, disprove any sort of creation. I'm just saying that evolution is backed up by science and there's a lot of research that goes into um, into um, stuff like bacterial resistance and whatnot that wouldn't even be a thing without evolution but I'm sorry I'm not really that prepared today um but yeah I just wanted to open with that and um, just go to the discussion I guess because I don't really have too much you bet we can go to the discussion so with that that's going to be oh that's right i forgot we uh we do have rebuttals but if you guys would like we can go to the discussion given that that i guess would make sense because standing uh unless you want to do a quick rebuttal i guess i could just kind of uh touch on the two things that he mentioned there in regards to um evolution being uh, backed up by science and bacterial uh, resistance, for example. Unfortunately for um, evolutionists there, James, you know, these mutations, they're not, um, they're not construction, they're destruction. And an example like bacterial resistance, a lot of times is due to a loss of information. And you're not going to take your fish to fishermen um, by losing information. There needs to be a net gain versus a net loss. And I talked a lot about um, genetic entropy, the accumulation of low impact deleterious mutations. And I know Joseph and I here, we're not going to disagree on, you know, the mechanisms or the proposed mechanisms for evolution, which would be mutations and natural selection, but they obviously lack significant um, creative powers say in regards to the origin of phenotypic complexity, anatomical novelty, of course, because as I, as I indicated in my opening, based on pre-existing heterozygosity, uh, species are not static and obviously neither are their, their genomes. Therefore, when this genetic information um, is say decompressed, deciphered, unscrambled, um, this isn't gonna be sufficient evidence for bacteria to biologist evolution because obviously this information here it's already it's already present and stored in, in the genome so <laughs> he's gonna have to show us an example of you know new novel information a mutation creating new novel information uh, to the genome because if you're going to go from a single celled organism to a multi-celled organism to a fish to an amphibian to a reptile to a mammal to a monkey to a man that's going to take incredible um increases in net information, of course. And he, he said it's, it's backed up by science. Science means to know, you know, how do we know? We test, we observe, we demonstrate, we retest. 
And the thing is, all the best evidence for evolution, it's being overturned, James. I mean, you can look to the supposed claim that evolutionists say that human to chimpanzee genetic identity is 98 to 99% similar. And we now know that that's based on preferential and selective treatment of data. Um, the actual identity is only about 88% um, similar and clearly indicates that, you know, humans are not apes and, and that they're actually created separately and uniquely in, in the image of God. So not only does the Bible prove this, but, but so does DNA evidence. So all the major evidence, and we can, we can kind of go through some of that in the discussion portion. Um, so his opening, he talked about the evolutionary theory, I guess, being backed up by science and then used the example of um, bacterial resistance. But we obviously observe death, degeneration, and um, extinction. And, and we predict death, degeneration, and extinction, of course, after the fall. We would predict we're going down, not up. And many of these changes, even in regards to bacterial resistance that he talks about, it's due to mutation and in, in natural selection, but it's, it's based on adaptive degeneration. So that's all consistent with um, a biblical-based model. Um, I guess I'm pretty good with that rebuttal if he wants to jump right into uh, the discussion portion. Gotcha. So we will reset the clock for 30 minutes for open dialogue. And uh, gentlemen, we'll kind of basically defer to you. So whichever one of you would like to start first is really just an open conversation. Sure. Yeah, I, I guess um, it would be appropriate here to um, to ask Joseph, especially if we're going to be talking about um, evolution here. You know, what what exactly does he mean by the word? Evolution. I would say, you know, the biological evolution means a change in allele frequency in, in populations over time. I think that's a good definition. What, what would your definition be there, Joe? I would define it simply as change over time, like a lot, like you said. But it happens more at the population level. We wouldn't expect, like, uh, like what Kent Hoban said, like a dog to come from a non-dog or something like that. All that it simply means is small variations over an extended period of time build up to cause speciation. So that takes a time scale that is rather counterintuitive. So a lot of people can't really think on those time scales. So, right. So, I mean, I would agree, you know, it, it's the change in populations. It's, it's not the change in individuals, populations are evolving, right? So population of dogs are, um, producing more dogs and, and slowly evolving over time. But, uh, you know, th that type of evolution, sure, I, I agree, it explains the survival of the fittest, but, you know, does it explain the, the arrival of the fittest? Because you, you talked about, you know, the variation, right, the small-scale variation, but I'm talking about, you know, the major innovations, major origin events, so you have major um, new forms of, of life. So I, I should ask, I think it comes down to limits, for example. So you, um, you mentioned dogs, you mentioned time. Uh, two questions. Do you believe that, you know, a population of dogs today ultimately came from something that was say non-dog long ago and far away? And do you believe there's limits to the change, whether it's physical, genomic, for example? Can you get a dog, say, as big as an elephant? They're both mammals. We know there's animals as big as an elephant, like an elephant. Or can you get a dog, say, as small as, as a mouse, a pygmy mouse? They're also both mammals. And we know there's animals as small as a mouse, like a mouse. Um, so do you believe there's limits, uh, physical, genomic? Uh, go ahead. Well, I defer to, I don't know, Aaron Ross said it, something called the law of phylogen phylogeny or something. The law of monophyly? You, yeah, a law of monophyly where you, right. you can't really oh, escape oh, your ancestry. So, yeah. I would say that everything that we see is consistent with um, what we found in the lab regarding evolution. So if, if, well, okay, so um, for one, do you believe that there are genomic and, and physical limits? For example, can you get a dog as, as big as a whale? We know there's animals as, as big as a whale, so whether through selective breeding, or do you believe there's some type of physical limit there? In, in the law of monophyly, that's true. That just means, you know, we can never outgrow our, our ancestry. So a eukaryote will never stop being a eukaryote. A mammal will never stop being a mammal. But do you believe a dog today, population of dogs today, came from something ultimately that was non-dog, say, long ago and far away in the uh, unobservable uh, past? Go ahead. Quite possibly, but they would be in the same uh, category as whatever species branched off of that common ancestor. 
And then do you believe there's physical limits, genomic limits? Like, do you believe, uh, do you believe ultimately that say dogs, whales, pine trees, and say bacteria and fleas are all related through common ancestry? More than likely. Okay, so um, I'd imagine that you'd agree there's at least physical limits. Say you're not gonna get a dog as, as big as an, as an elephant or say as a whale. Oh, I don't think we can determine that. I don't think we are ever gonna live long enough to really figure out whether or not that could happen. And then you mentioned, you know, we see it in the lab. Well, I'm not too sure if you're familiar with um, Lenski's E. coli experiment. So he's he's been raising and producing, you know, thousands and thousands of generation of, of these bacteria. And that's large scale evolution being observed in, um, you know, in, in real time, in millions of years of history. And, you know, what they've seen is reductive evolution, as I've talked about, you know, degenerative adaptive changes and the beneficial mutations seen in this experiment in the lab. Uh, like I said, the reductive loss of function, loss of promoter, um, loss of genes. And it looks like they're getting rid of genes short term, obviously. Um, it, it, but it's long term degeneration. And if, if we see in this experience, experiment millions and millions of years of, say, evolutionary history and observed time, and all we observe is bacteria producing bacteria, and all we observe is, of course, adaptation, but we see that it's largely accomplished by means of loss of function and loss of regulation mutations. Is it empirical science to believe that dogs, bananas, fleas, and bacteria are related through common ancestry? Like, do you believe that's empirical science? And can you demonstrate that? Go ahead. Um, I'm not really into the biological sciences. I'm more of a math and physics guy, but I believe that they've mapped the genome sufficiently enough to prove evolution. And also I've seen no proof that is um, relevant that would support your hypothesis of genetic entropy. I think that would be have some serious implications if it were true, and I don't think that. Well, we can. Thing. Well, we can see we can see uh, genomic degradation. For example, even in this Lenski experiment, we see reductive evolution. We see that bacteria produce bacteria. So you know, it's, what do you it's define as reductive? What do you define as? How do you say it? Reductive. Uh, how do you say it? Well, I would say reductive evolution would be so, for example, in this experiment, um, you can see that that there are beneficial mutations, but um, it, it's by a loss of function. There's been observed a loss of promoter, um, loss of information overall. So in, in a way, that's adaptive gain, but it's through uh, so, reductive means. And, and Lenski himself will even admit to that. Um, I'm, not, yeah, Michael I'm B. not certain. I'm not certain how true this is or not, but I was reading research a long time ago about how bacteria who gain bacteria resistance, I mean, antibacterial resistance will be exposed to bacterial phages right. for a period of time, and then they'll gain resistance to that, and then they'll lose their resistance to antibiotics, and then... Well, a lot of the times, because it's so, because it's due to say a broken promoter, broken broken gene, for example, like sickle cell anemia, for example, it's, it's not really... Um, you know, these beneficial so, mutations being observed, they're not really taking things forward. So it turns out that these resistant bacteria, they're actually weaker at the so end. When, of the um, so when the bacteria lose their bacterial resistance, are they having a promoter being repaired or how is that working? Well, what they're doing, like, for example, for the resistant bacteria, they're losing... Um, it, it, it's kind of like if I were to come and handcuff everybody, but then someone didn't have hands, so they couldn't be handcuffed well yeah it's beneficial in that particular situation and environment but overall it's reductive they're going back into the environment um weaker handicapped lazy they're pinning themselves into a corner so this is what we'd expect and, and we can see it as well we can see there's a pandemic right I'm, I'm sure you'd agree that we see alzheimer's dementia autism's on the rise asthma, autoimmune diseases, cancers, immunological disease. I mean, this is entropic degeneration on, on all levels. Do you know how many um, mutations we pass on to our children per generation, for example? Do you, first, I would like to ask you if you have proof that things are getting worse, actual empirical evidence. 
Yeah, well, for example, I just showed you that, and even evolutionists, you know, would agree that I've talked to that study this, there is a pandemic, we can see disease, mutation related disease, thousands and thousands are added to the database every year, Alzheimer's, dementia, cancers, we even see it in paleogenomic evidence, for example, we see, and I have a paper here uh, to demonstrate the fact that mammoth populations, for example, they carried an, an elevated genetic load, Neanderthal, for example, you know, they also had a high genetic load, 40% less fit than modern humans and a lot of the claimed ancestors of say humans in the evolutionary process is actually uh, due to uh, genomic degeneration for example I'm not sure if you're familiar with the hobbits you know they're referred to as homo floriensis they were um, they were highly inbred and they also suffered from reductive evolution that's why you see those pathologies you know body size uh, reduction reduced brain volume um, so, I mean, I could probably just go, go on and on and on about the evidence what, for genomic degradation. I mean, do, by what metric, more? by what metric have they, um, do they determine genetic entropy if it's such a thing? Because I still haven't seen any empirical evidence of it. Well, for one, because I, I asked you about the mutation rate. So you can see, and it's generally known too, that, you know, um, the mutation rate is 100 mutations per person per generation. That means our children have about 100 more mutations than we have, and our grandchildren are going to have 100 more mutations than they have. So on a population level, that's pretty disturbing. It's even disturbing on a personal level, but on a population level, that's even more disturbing because you said you're a math guy. I mean, if, if there are 100 mutations per person and there are 7 billion people on the planet, I mean, that's simple math. That means there's 700 billion new mutations entering the human population this generation. So let me ask you there, Joseph, you know, what, um, what type of selection, what type of selection can you point me to that's going to be able to eliminate so many mutations that are pouring into the human population 700 billion this generation alone i mean how are you going to solve that that problem well first of all i have to talk about the fact that you're making a lot of assumptions here first you're assuming that every mutation isn't beneficial in any way you're assuming that genetic entropy is a thing and you're not I'm really sure, giving me a metric by thing. which we can determine what is harmful or entropic to the gene to the gene pool so i I have never heard a good answer to this, so I would like you to well, point me to an actual study that talks about how this supposed genetic entropy is affecting us negatively. Right. So for one, every evolutionist I've talked to, they admit that beneficial mutations are rare. They admit that the majority of mutations are like, are you are you disagreeing with the fact that human mutation is catastrophic to the genome? And are you are you disagreeing um, with the fact that most mutations are are deleterious, especially like a near neutral mutation. I mean, it's kind of like rust on a car, right? As uh, it's, it's continuous, it's destructive. You can't see each rust event, but like I said, it's continuous and destructive, just like a small, say, point mutation or a small mistake in a you know a book the size of an encyclopedia. It's not going to show a clear phenotype right away, but overall, it's degenerative and, and reductive. I mean, metric wise, you can you can sequence genomes. You can look at. Uh, deletions, you can look at duplications, you can look at the human mutation rate, like I said, 100 per person per um, generation. I mean, what if these if these who's mutations... Making these, who's making that claim, though? 100 per person, who's making that claim? Um, you could, you can, honestly, you can just Google, you know, what's the human mutation rate. The, the main paper that it came from, it, it is a secular paper. It is a, you know, the evolutionists themselves, they're the ones that have sequenced the genomes, you know, from the parent to daughter and uh, it, it's just it, it's pretty well a, a fact and I'm not sure if I'm sure you're familiar with neutral mutations right they're 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 not acted upon by natural selection but the thing is natural selection can't do anything against these near neutral mutations so they accumulate it's it's this accumulation of near neutral um, low impact deleterious mutations so I just want to ask you again um, you know what type of selection what type of selection is going to be able to remove um, you know this accumulating damage because obviously you know well, the beneficial mutations they'll be amplified and and the, the the really high impact bad mutations they'll be uh you know natural selection will get rid of them obviously it keeps a population as strong as it can be but it's the near neutral ones i mean what are you going to do to to stop the damage uh, joseph go ahead well if you want to stop the damage i mean natural selection would get rid of the genetics that aren't fit to survive in their environment obviously 
there's nothing about uh, natural selection that says that a species has to get stronger. It's just all mm. natural selection does is weed out things that can't survive the environment. It's not a force. It doesn't have a consciousness. Right. So, I mean, you know, obviously we agree that natural selection happens. It's a fine tuning mechanism. And like I said, you know, natural selection, like you said as well. So I agree with that. It's going to remove. But the problem is. I disagree is with the idea of it being a fine tuning mechanism because that would entail that it has an end goal in mind, which it doesn't. As right. Far I mean, as we it's, can tell. it's probably better to just call it differential, you know, reproduce. A lot of people say survival of the fittest. It's probably more so survival of the luckiest who's reproducing more. But the thing is, natural selection, like you said, you know, it, it's going to remove these worst deleterious mutations, those high impact deleterious mutations and, and detrimental mutations. Um, it's going to get rid of those, but it, and it's only going to amplify the very best beneficial mutations. So let's say your antibiotic resistance, even though I, I believe they're, they're reductive for the most part, sickle cell anemia. But the problem is, Joseph, is um, this indicates that the accumulating damage is largely invisible and unselectable because it's those uh, mutations that fall within the, the, the non-selection box, you know, the ones that aren't the worst deleterious and the ones that aren't the best beneficial. What do you do about those? Because you have to address the key issue of net gain versus net loss. And there's a clear net loss based on the relentless influx of deleterious mutations. Because if your model is, is any, any, anything um, scientific, you're going to have to explain explain away the, the data. I mean, do you have I, I know there are some rescue devices. There are some models that the evolutionist population geneticists have brought forth to explain the influx of uh, deleterious mutations. Do you know of of what they are? No, not really. I'm not a biology guy, but all I'm all I'm saying is you're making a lot of assumptions that I have never seen addressed by the scientific community as a whole. Well, population geneticists do and acknowledge plus, the fact that man is... You, I would also have to ask you before you go ahead, how do you... By what metric do you judge whether someone has gained or lost any information? Because well, I mean... That, you, that's been a you, problem for a while that I've never seen addressed properly either. Well, I, I, it's, a ta it's a common evolutionary tactic to just avoid the fact that of having to admit that mutations overall are catastrophic. You can sequence the genomes. You can look at the various types of mutations, deletions, point mutations, inversion mutations, frame shift mutations. They're all reductive. You can sequence the genome, see what's being, um, obviously see what, what type of loss is uh, being observed there. You can look at variation within the genome. You could look at decreases of heterozygosity to homozygosity. There's lots of different ways to measure the information loss. You, you, everybody knows beneficial mutations are rare. Uh, you know, near neutral deleterious mutations are pouring in faster than they can be removed. You can calculate the fact that we, um, you know, that we inherit 100 new mutations per person per generation from our grandparents. I mean, there's a thousand different ways that you can um, measure the information loss. And, and the thing is, when something's broken, so for example, sickle, sickle cell anemia, you know, if it's due to a, a, a broken, you know, protein, broken cell, broken gene, I mean, broken indicates that it's it's a loss of, of some type. I mean, are you disagreeing with the fact that a lot of these adaptive degenerative mutations are a loss of information? Is this just an evolutionary tactic to avoid the, the obvious data? I have no idea, to be honest, but I would also like you, since you're making the claim that they're rare, but how how rare is rare when it comes to beneficial mutations? Well, the thing is, you're gonna have to, uh, you're gonna have to compensate for the relentless influx of deleterious mutations. So can you give me one or two um, beneficial mutations that are not reductive, that are not, you know, due to a loss of information of any, any kind? Because I even know the big ones that I've, I've talked to, you know, people like Jackson Weed a bunch of times, they bring up things like melano mutation, examples of adaptive immunity, nylon digestion by bacteria. I mean, these are all based on a loss of say specificity loss of information you can read this all in in the mm -hmm. literature so i mean the, what's the best beneficial mutation that you can um, that you can show me and uh, and even just demonstrate your um, your model you know I've, I've given plenty of examples during my opening of a biblical based model um, if you want to address those as well because if it's creation versus evolution it looks like the biblical creation model is being um, it's being demonstrated too, though James, how much more time, brother? I, um, I asked. Uh, I asked which model Genesis one or two. 
So are you are you saying that Genesis one and two are contradictory, two different creation accounts? Give me one second. Hold on. How much more time, James? Uh, let's see. Sorry, uh, eleven minutes and eleven and a half minutes. What Come time on. is it? Give me a second. Nine twenty-five. You got the time over there. Nine twenty-five Central Time. Uh, we might have to wrap this up. Oh, sorry so, about that. Uh, you know, I, I, and I don't like to straw man the evolutionists. Like, for example, there are so population geneticists do admit that man is degenerating, and, and they've come up with rescue devices, of course, such as mutation count mechanisms, synergistic epistasis. I'm going to provide papers that show that. Um, these are not biologically real, and, and they've also been falsified because these low-impact deleterious mutations, they are uh, they are accumulating in the genome, and a lot of your um, better proponents of evolution, you know, say Jackson, Lee, Aaron, and Ron, you know, they talk a lot about a, a trade-off, okay, in regards to beneficial mutations, but I'd like to see what your answer is to this because... Uh, Joseph, while the whole genome is degenerating and say while a few nucleotide sites may be improving, huge numbers, it's a fact, they're being degraded and this type of trade-off that a lot of these um, stronger proponents of evolution, you know, talk about, it's obviously not sustainable and what it does is it results in a shrinking functional genome size. Um, so if you're throwing out all this information there, uh, Joseph, from lots of nucleotide sites based on all these mutations, even duplications are largely deleterious, you know, you're, you're trying to replace all that information with, say, a single desirable even point mutation, whatever it is. I mean, can you give us an explanation on how to rid the genome of these deleterious mutations? And what's your best beneficial mutation that actually adds novel information to the genome? Go ahead. Oh, I don't have one. I'm definitely not into the biology major thing. But what would you... Okay, okay, that being said then, let's since we only got a, a little bit of time left, why don't you, what's your number one best evidence for molecules to man? Because I think it's, it's, it's pretty evident that obviously the genome's degenerating. It's more consistent with a biblical-based model in the fall. So if you're going to try and convince someone of that large-scale goo-to-you type evolution, what, what evidence would you throw at them there, Joe? I hate to... Uh, cut you off, Joe. Like, forgive me, because I know that you want to respond. Uh, this might be a good chance to go to the Q and A, just because. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, have... if you want to, if you want to do this, James, since we're gonna have just a very short closing. That being said, with the questions that I asked and the statements I made, it's more so. Hey, present a little bit of evolution. You want to give him a quick short closing, then I can give myself a quick closing, and then do if you want a couple. I, well, just to keep it in order, like, uh, if you want to do a, a closing standing, you can, and then if Joe wants to use his closing, he can, and then we can jump into the Q&A with whatever we have left. Because uh, I think I think uh, you started first, and so just to keep it in order, we'll have you go first for the okay. closing, and then Joseph. Well, you know, I, I think it's pretty obvious here, especially if you look back at even just the eight minutes that I had to provide evidence. I mean, there's just a ton of evidence in, in genetics that demonstrates uh, creation. We look to the created heterozygosity hypothesis, you know, if we have these heterozygous ancestors, for example, that got encoded with tens of millions of functional DNA differences, you know, an almost limitless variety of combinations of chromosomes, genes, and traits are gonna be possible. We look to, you know, mechanisms other than mutations, say recombination gene conversion, and, and that's gonna provide many new varieties of combinations of traits quickly, since the differences are already built in. So visible distinctiveness, it's, it's gonna be rapid. So the origin of species model is also better explained based on the creation model, and it's testable, it's falsifiable. We look to DNA function. We can look to rare alleles versus common alleles to identify what's created and what's not created. We can make predictions and retrodictions based on mitochondrial and nuclear DNA differences and rates. We see that evolutionists have overpredicted the mitochondrial DNA differences. They've underpredicted the nuclear DNA differences. And we're making further predictions on the LMN haplogroups, on all these uh, mutation rates in, in thousands of different species. So at the end of the day, the, the, the evolutionists are losing uh, losing bad. And just based on our brief conversation here for 30 minutes, it seems like Joseph's confused because he's treating two very different phenomenon, adaptation to environments and evolution of higher life forms. That's why I asked him a series, a series of questions and he didn't really... Those aren't technically... He, 
different though. We'll just so so sorry. Just to let uh, Sandy for Truth clo do his closing, and then we'll definitely oh, give sorry. you your full uh, five yeah, minutes. Yeah, because he he seems to think that they're the, the, the same thing. So I, I always say evolutionists are, are confused. That's why we have lots of proud graduates from SpongeBob University, and and it it sounds like he really does believe in this science fiction religion, and most of them do, unfortunately. But it's just not science. It's a science fiction um, based religion and, and i appreciate their zeal for their science fiction based religion but it, it, it's not science and it doesn't take a genius to see that you know these two different things the adaptation to environments and evolution of higher life forms are um are, are different issues because adaptation of as, as i've explained can routinely be accomplished by loss of information and the development of higher life forms of course always requires a large increase in in net information and and as junk dna paradigm and, and junk dna era has been overturned and it's dead all the best evolutionary evidences especially if i was an evolutionist you know i'd bring up things like pseudo genes human chromosome fusion two nested hierarchies nested hierarchies you know on a genetic level and then on a you know comparing the anatomy um, all these different things can be better explained in a creation model anyways. But, you know, these types of, of evidence like pseudo genes, shared genetic mistakes, human chromosome fusion to ERVs, endogenous retroviruses, they're, they're very best evidence. They're all being overturned. And, you know, pseudo genes, for example, they're now known to be functional DNA elements, not actually mistakes. And the human chromosome fusion two, you know, the alleged site where the fusion supposedly took place, it actually represents a highly organized functional gene and, and most importantly there's lack of evidence for cryptic centromere sites so uh the more we study the genome because we understand very little of the dna language but the more we study it the more we discover about just how functional it, it really is One minute it's left. overturning all the many uh evidences for evolution so I'll, I'll conclude there and allow joseph to finish off with his uh concluding statement thanks james you bet and so it's about four minutes and uh joseph we uh will give you your closing statement i'll start the clock on your first word oh we can go to the q a if you want my friend's about to come by soon enough. you got it <clears throat> q a it is so uh we do have a good amount of questions thanks so much for your questions everybody and we're going to try to go through these as fast as possible as we definitely have limited time so first up thanks so much for your super chat uh brian stevens really appreciate it he says uh, if evolution was proven true, would you still believe in a Christian God? So I, I guess, my guess is that's for standing for truth. So standing for truth. Are you saying, so his question was, if, if, if evolution is true, would I still believe in the Christian God? Yes. If it was proven true, would you still believe in the Christian God? Well, if, I'd have to talk to him personally, see what he means by evolution. If he means, you know, ponds come to people evolution, well, obviously, you know, that is contradictory to all known empirical evidence. So, but hypothetically, you know, my final authority is, is the Bible itself and, and um, looking at the Bible from a, a literal um, interpretation, say, of Genesis. And the thing is, all known empirical evidence, observational evidence, fits perfectly with what we know about um you know, Genesis and obviously the Bible as a whole. So hypothetically, I mean, it's my final authority is, you know, the Bible. And if evolution was true, that type of goo to you, fish to philosopher type evolution, well, to be honest with you, if, if the Bible is God's word and it's infallible, like we know it is, then Genesis would probably be totally different and it would probably indicate a level of evolutionary theory. And then, yeah, I'd probably believe in it because uh, God's word is, is accurate and, and true. Let God be true and every man a liar. So, you know, hypothetically, if, the, if evolution was true, the Bible would probably teach that evolution is true. So thanks uh, for the question. Gosh, yeah. Brian Stevens has another super chat. Thanks so much for your super, super chat, Brian Stevens. He says, uh, why did standing for truth not show for the Aaron Raw, uh, the Aaron Raw debate? So I addressed that in, in my opening with um, the SpongeBob Imagination University and the SpongeBob Awards. So I would love to have a debate with uh, R&R, even, even a, a structured debate. People don't seem to understand what that is. For example, today was structured. You know, we confirmed, we discussed ahead of time. James, you're an amazing, amazing host, amazing moderator. We, we communicate, we email back and forth. We agree on a structure. And this is a good format. You get a couple of opening statements, a couple rebuttals, lengthy 30-minute discussion, a closing statement, some Q&A. That's all I ask for. And non-sequitur show, they're not... 
nonpartisan. So, you know, I'm, I'm really looking for a debate against Aaron Raw, hopefully here on Modern Day Debate, because I like supporting you, James. You're a great channel. And the thing is, what non sequitur show did, and most people realize this other than the sheep that just follow them blindly, you know, let, let's say after this hangout, James, I decide to make a hangout and title it Standing for Truth versus Aaron Raw and Steve McRae. And then they don't show up because there's no confirmation, nothing. I just make the hangout and then I declare victory. Oh yeah, that looks like looks like they were a no-show. I mean, come on, that's just ridiculous. So Aaron Ra, you wanna get a structured debate here on Modern Debate? Uh, bring it on there, brother. Got it. Uh, next up, uh, definitely appreciate that super chat and thank you for this other one. Uh, Brian Stevens, he says, how does intelligent design explain the rise of tetrachromat vision in humans? Uh, and then in parentheses, he has a citation, Jordan et al., uh, Jordan et al., which is uh, Jordan and others, uh, 2010. And then he says, evolution can explain this via random mutations. Uh, is that a, wait a minute, um, I can't, it was, is that a question for me or for Joseph? I think it's for you and I can read it, uh, I can read it again, I know it's a mouthful. I think they're talking want. about tetrachromacy where you have an extra, something extra in the eye that allows you to perceive color differently, am I mistaken about that? So. Yeah, I'm not sure. There's a lot of storytelling involved in evolutionary theory and how certain things evolve from simple forms to more complex forms. Um, so I'd have to look more into uh, the specifics of that uh, that question. So if you have anything to say on it, Joseph, we can go on to the next one. I don't know that much about tetrachromacy, but I heard it was a thing, and I'm not going to say it's real or not. It's probably is though. Gotcha. And then next up, uh, thanks so much for your super chat, DB Cisco. Really appreciate it. He says. I don't believe your mythology is real. Uh, my gut tells me that's for standing for truth. Do <laughs> you want to respond? Yeah, you know what? Um, he can believe that my mythology is, is not true. But the thing is, at the end of the day, he's the one that, you know, believes that dogs, pine trees, whales, and um, carrots are all related through common ancestry. So, you know, at the end of the day, that's a science fiction based religion. That's why we say evolutionists, they hope, they dream, they imagine that type of large scale evolution. It only happens in the imagination of those that want to believe it. I mean, you can look at their arguments, for example, R and Ra, you know, he, he talks about how dogs, whales and pine trees are all related because, you know, they're all eukaryotes. Wow, you know, that means bananas and, and trees must be related because they're both yellow except for the tree. I mean, that's the type of logic that they actually uh, um, use to vindicate their science fiction based mythology. So they, they can imagine all they want. And I've been getting lots of applications for SpongeBob University. So I'm going to look them over. I might call some of these uh, more militant evolutionists like the one who just asked the question and then we'll do an interview and see how, just how wild his, his imagination is and maybe he'll be accepted. So thanks James. Gotcha. Next one, Brian Stevens says, and thanks for your super chat. Uh, he says, stay for truth. You should really publish your PowerPoint with the tooth fairy in a scientific journal and debunk evolution for good. PS debate Cy Gart. Yeah. And you know what? Cy Gart would be an awesome, uh, um, a p proponent of evolutionism to debate um, because you know oftentimes in my in my openings I put forth a pretty strong model based on low genetic diversity um, all all direct predictions from a literal interpretation of Genesis one Y chromosome one mitochondrial E for example three major haplogroups testable predictions based on created heterozygosity and if you want to look at a major debate because um, Cy Gart, you know, he works for BioLogos, so he's, he's a proponent of evolutionism and, and a scientist of BioLogos. A major debate was Dr. Nathaniel Jensen versus Dr. Venema of BioLogos. Four-hour debate, probably the, the, the most recommended debate I'd say for people to watch if they're on the fence. Because Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, I mean, he, he smokes Dr. Venema and, and Cy Gart who works for BioLogos and so does Venema. He even admitted, he admitted, yeah, you know, Venema would admit that, you know, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen is one. And uh, there's some written debates you can you can read about not Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. He's written replacing Darwin. So the biblical base model is strong. And you got people like uh, Cy Gart, who's, I guess, somewhat unbiased if he's, if he's admitting that, you know, 
um, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen is a force to be reckoned with. So yeah, I'd love to, to debate him. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Uh, next up, Shreeded got your super chat. Thanks so much. It means a lot. I saw it was, uh, it, it didn't have a message attached and sometimes people just do that as a gift to the channel. Otherwise, if you have a message that you want to attach, let me know. I can read it. Just letting you know, sometimes when I do a super chat on other channels, I forget to attach a message. So just in case it was, let me know. Uh, DB Cisco, thanks so much for your super chat. We totally appreciate it. He actually says, uh, pathetic straw man standing for truth. See, what's funny is how pathetic the straw man arguments are on the evolutionist side. For example, you debate them and let's say you bring up genetic entropy and, you know, they, they fight the truth of genetic entropy. For example, you know, let's say Jackson Wheat, for example, you know, he puts out a video today, genetic entropy, that I'm really looking forward to debunking and addressing. And they just speak of the obvious. Beneficials happen, selection happens, adaptation happens. It's all a big straw man because anyone with a basic understanding of, say, genetics, they know and they understand these things. But the argument of, say, let's say genetic entropy, just for one example, that it begins after acknowledging those things and someone like, Jackson Weed talks about how, you know, John John Sanford misrepresents Kimura and talks about um, the, the, the zone of no selection. But the thing is, you know, Kimura, his analysis of the problem was was over, oversimplified. That's just that's just known. And the crucial issue is about defining the correct distribution of mutation effects. And we can see that evolutionists, you can you can argue with them for hours and hours over just one beneficial mutation that actually adds net information to the genome. And, and, and they can't show you it. And even if they show you one or two, the fact that most mutations fall within the no selection zone and that almost all of them are deleterious, that's not going to counterbalance the accumulating damage. So evolutionists are the king at straw man arguments. They don't know how to represent our model to say there is no model, even though there clearly is. You got someone who's somewhat unbiased, I guess, Sigart. He's admitting, wow, watch out for Dr. Jensen. Okay. So, I hate to cut thanks. in, just to uh, keep us going through the questions as many as possible. Thanks so much for that super chat. Thanks for your answer, Sandy, for truth. And then we have Athena, goddess of wisdom, uh, says, with regards to standing for truth, he does realize that Batman could exist in real life, right? All he would need is a lot of money and a lot of time. I think that's in reference to your <laughs> opening scene. Yeah, I'm a huge Batman fan, so you know what? I would, that'd be awesome if, if there was a real uh, real Batman. Some of the stuff he does might be a little, a little far-fetched, but I guess if there was uh, anybody who could be a real... Um, Superhero would probably be if there was a real life Bruce Wayne, but Superman. I mean, you could you can put a speedo over your pants all you want. You'll never be able to fly, and you can have as much time as you want, and you're never going to turn your bacteria to a whale. So, Superman, Mary Poppins, ponds come to people evolution, all just a religion. They all take imagination. Put it that even if it was true, it's it's not science. You can't demonstrate such a thing. Gotcha. Thanks so much. And uh, Joseph, I don't want to keep you longer than you promised. You've already stuck with us for longer than promised if you have to go. Maybe you can end it with one question for him since I've been going on for quite a while. Um, Joseph, if you want to take a question, I know that you haven't got, gotten a lot of action during the Q&A from the audience. Oh, sure. Questions. I'll take, then you I'll can take end one it there. and I have to go really quick. Okay, no problem. But don't feel obligated to take it. Um, Landon Freeman uh, says... Uh, Harvestmen arachnids have allegedly been in stasis for over 400 million years. How could stasis persist for so long throughout the fossil record when stable environments wouldn't last that long? Oh, I have no idea what he's talking about, so I wouldn't know. Gotcha. But any anyways, I, I really do have to go now. I'll see you. Thanks so much for being here, Joseph. We totally appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You bet. My, thank you for being here. And so with that, just to be fair, because uh, we have uh, Standing for Truth has gotten a ton of airtime, uh, we will probably wrap up. Uh, and don't get me wrong, Standing for Truth, I know that there are more questions for you, but uh, given that uh, you know Joseph only had one question, I think we'll probably end it there. And so... Uh, we appreciate both of you debaters, 
If this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button. We've got a lot more debates coming up, especially this Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which will have Dr. Robert M. Price, which should be a lot of fun. And with that, I want to say thanks for being here. Thanks for your questions. Definitely, I'm thrilled to be back and to spend time with everybody here tonight. And uh, we really appreciate you being here. So with that, uh, as mentioned, the speakers have their links in the description. And keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Take care, everybody.